Welcome back to the Nutri Medical Report and our news anchor for the live stream channel and our geopolitical military uh, expert is Tim Alexander, Lord Sterling. If you go to Google Lord Sterling, S T I R L I N G, you get your business with one S dot blogspot dot com. Uh, his blog is one of the most important to actually check daily because he's following it and from a multi chess. Uh, like space chess, like Spock would play in Star Trek, uh, and looking at it from a strategic point that's, of view, that, that's exactly what it is. It's it's chess only on multiple le- levels at the same right. time. Right, and, and they're all interacting. All these different scenarios interact, and I see a lot of different experts that make what I call misstatements, and I I think more strategically, which is why when I play these kind of games, I was good at them or better than average because you have to look at things in a multi-level uh, way a, an interactive non-linear way you, you can't nice. disconnect you can't disconnect the possibility of a general middle eastern war world war three uh... In, in what's happening on the turkish uh... syrian border you can't disconnect that from the eurozone problems and the global economic uh, crisis the, right. on, on the surface, they're, well, they're, they're totally different things. But in reality, they're very much a part of the same operative plan. Yeah, uh, yeah and in fact, I think plan. the operative uh, uh, kind of uh, schema that I try to teach, and I think you, you do as well, <coughs> that what we're dealing with here is the economic and the proxy war phase of World War Three. Yeah. We're yeah. moving from an economic phase that started with Dov Sockheim stealing $2.3 trillion at 9-11 and the self-inflicted wound of 9-11 to cover up a financial fiasco, and then the promulgated illegal wars of Iraq and Afghanistan uh, with weapons of mass destruction, which caused trillion-dollar debts, and by by debt they shall destroy them. They literally took off the books in George Bush's administration. Obama put them back on the books to cost these wars, which are trillion-dollar wars, and that's why we're in the pickle purposely. And now that we have QE3, we are literally destroying. We're in a currency war already with China. No one wants to say there's a currency war, but the fact that we are printing money like, uh, as I say, the printing presses uh, underneath the Federal Reserve building uh, have to be hosed down as they're hot, <laughs> as, as, as a boiler ready to blow. Full speed ahead, yeah. Right. Uh, you see Obama and, and there. Uh, Calling down the stairwell to uh, to Bernanke down there at the printing press with his printing press hat on, saying, "I don't care, Ben. Hose them down and keep printing." <laughs> and you know the, uh, the the Federal Reserve does not have the constitutional authority to print money, uh, but that's all right because we just ignored the Constitution a better part of a hundred years ago when we approved it, and and before that time we didn't have a federal income tax. Why? Right. We didn't need it. We, we raised federal revenue from import duties and various things, and the government wasn't near as big. It didn't need to be near as big. Once we had the Federal Reserve in, then we, we got ourselves into World War One, World War Two, and who knows how many wars. I can't even tell you how many wars we're in right now, if you count all the drones that we have various places and all the people <coughs> we're killing in many different countries. Now, right now, Turkey has, is staging new war games uh, virtually on the Syrian-Turkish border. Um, constantly, Turkey is, under, is doing provocations, uh, and it, it, it amounts to playing with matches inside a, um, uh, you know... Uh, a gas tank. Uh, yeah, a gas tank. Okay, <laughs> now... Uh, uh, how all this uh, and, and this it also interfaces with uh, the election cycle that we're in we have about uh, a little over two weeks now to the presidential election um, or C election I guess I call it S-E-E election or yeah, yeah. instead of B-S, it says CBS you know C the letter CBS I call it S-E-E B-S all the uh, there, the there's stuff. definitely a lot of BS involved. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of seeing BS. Yeah, <laughs> okay. just like Candy Crowley trying to trying to you know as she's flying around in her witch's broom trying to tell Romney to shut up and just take his licks from Obama who's prancing around like a spring rooster. Was uh, that her he, broomstick or did she borrow that from Hillary? I don't know. I think she borrowed it. I think it was a rent a broom. Uh, but <laughs> but 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 never, nevertheless, what happens is we have a situation where. She was so ignorant and so even not fact-checking 
I think when the foreign policy debate comes back on Monday, Obama is going to make mincemeat. It'd be made mincemeat by uh, by Romney. Obama will be destroyed because he evaded every substantive question. He tried to act indignant when you'd raise the issue or politicize it. When what do you mean politicize it? He's supposed to be the president. He's supposed to be the buck stops there. Well, he even tried to get Hillary Clinton to to, to fall on her sword. And at well, the same time, uh, he uh, he's if you if you look at President Obama. His nose is often way up in the air. He he has a, a rather arrogant uh, attitude sometimes. And I, my personal experience as a and this is purely amateur psychology, but uh, I think it's true. When you see someone that's very arrogant, almost always they're very insecure. Right. Uh, underneath that that arrogance is a deep insecurity, and I, and I think President Obama is very insecure. Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with his background, who he really is, the fact that he knows that he's not constitutionally, uh, he may not be constitutionally qualified. In any case, he's very spooky. The background, the whole, he he's a a a, a fellow that's deeply connected to the CIA. To communism and to all kind of stuff that. Uh, yeah, in fact, I saw Dinesh D'Souza's documentary last night. Dinesh D'Souza means he's Indian Portuguese, very bright, went to Dartmouth. This documentary doesn't deal with the fatherhood issue or whether or not uh, uh, he didn't dispute the fatherhood as being Kenyan, which, if you look at the Jill, uh, Joel uh, Gilbert's documentary, it's very clear that. Frank Marshall Davis, but what's even more interesting about Dinesh's one is it doesn't really matter in a sense who his biological father was. His mentor fathers, and it's a whole range of them, including professors at Harvard and Columbia, etc., were all communists, extremists, Muslim, uh, activists, Well, he and, and, and Rahm Emanuel were, were members of the biggest gay bathhouse in Chicago. Well, look at Bill Ayers. Bill Ayers, the, the biggest connection to me isn't even biological. It's his intellectual father, who was Bill Ayers, who actually, who actually Ghost wrote his so-called autobiography, Dreams yeah. from My Father, and made this <laughs> fantasy that he was somehow Kenyan. When if you see a picture of him with the rest of the Kenyan family, it's like he doesn't look anything like any of them, but he looks uh, like a dead ringer or Frank Marshall Davis, who he went to Frank's funeral. I mean, right out of the blue, they said in this movie with Dinesh, well, his father sought out uh, someone who would help mentor him. Mentor him, he's one of the strongest black <laughs> communists literally in, in in America that was on a watch list by the FBI that if the war broke out he was going to go to a detention camp and the reason is because Obama's grandfather was CIA he was shooting shots literally getting drunk with Frank Marshall Davis Frank Marshall Davis literally, literally could have transplanted part of his cortex into Obama Obama is no matter what his biological father is Obama is a Muslim apologist at the very least he's a communist and a, and a collectivist and he also is a narcissistic very unstable person who's got a psychopathy that i think if he thinks the power is slipping away he's going to do a false leg in the next two and a half three weeks before the election i'm very well concerned. That's, that's what i want to get into i think we're about to have a commercial here but uh we uh, we, we have an interesting convergence of events coming up uh, about a week from now. And uh, we could see uh, a real nightmare event in about a week. Uh, Are you talking about from the Middle East or a nightmare of a I'm talking about the Middle East. Uh, well, <laughs> oh, yeah, because you're the expert on that. I want you to expand on that because this is important to people grasp. But right now, the S-400 system, now the Russians put in place, the fact that they're repeatedly grounding Syrian jets flying from Russia to Syria, and now Syria is actually blocked out and won't allow Turkish airplanes to fly over their airspace. This is getting real touchy. Yeah, but it's, we'll, we'll get into this in just a second. And it's, it's, there's some interesting Absolutely. stuff coming together. Back in a moment with Tim Alexander. Again, check out the blog. We've got it transplanted over today's blog, but you want to check it out every day. And also go to our live stream channel. Tim puts on some amazing documentary clips on our live stream channel, open to all of our customers in the last six months.
Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. And uh, Tim, tell us the analysis of what uh, the, is the timeline here. Well, okay. Here, here, put, here, uh, I, before we, we do the timeline, I need to back up just a little bit. Um, the latest uh, trouble, in a sense, on the Turkish-Syrian border supposedly came when the Syrian army lobbed several mortar rounds across the border. Uh, they impacted in a, a Turkish town and killed several members of a family, several civilians. Now, the Syrians apologized for it, but they basically said, we didn't do it. And it is almost uh, virtually certain that the Syrian army did not fire those rounds. Those rounds were fired by the so-called Free Syrian Army, the foreign terrorists that have been infiltrated into Syria from Turkey. And it's also equally certain that the Turks knew this. In other words, it was a false flag event from word one. Now, since then, the Turks have engaged in various provocations. The the uh, forcing down of an airliner flying from Moscow to Syria it was a Syrian airline plane with a lot of Russians on board. They actually tortured four people on board the plane, uh, two of the uh, including two of the st- uh, flight crew. Uh, basically, they went and slapped really hard the Russian bear in the face. That's not wise. Um, That's very unwise. I mean, yeah, any hunter, let's say, working in uh, Kamchatka or British Columbia or or Washington State or Montana, slapping a a a giant, you know, a grizzly bear with six uh, to eight foot long, inch long, razor sharp, hard as iron claws, is the most unwise thing I think you can possibly do on the planet. Uh, Well, no, it's just fine if you want to commit suicide because about uh, a second later when those uh, razor sharp claws uh, rip you into several pieces, uh, it will be all over. But if you go historically back in time, 2,500 years, the most feared people in the Middle East were the Assyrians. Now, I want people to understand this, that the Syrians and the Russians are the two people on Earth that you absolutely don't cross. If yeah, you they're, cross they're, them, they're quite tough. <clears throat> tough, uh, no, they'll kill all your relatives. Anybody even with a name that sounds like yours, they'll kill. So the idea that they think they're going to just waltz over Syria, Syria was never completely integrated even into the so-called uh, the, the, French the, Turkey, Empire, yeah. the, the French Empire. So what people have to understand is that Russia was never defeated. I, 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 I had, a, after my wife died, I had a Russian girlfriend, and I and the church I belonged to has some Russians. They're, they're very interesting people. Uh, uh, the women tend to be uh, quite beautiful. Uh, and, but I'll tell you, there, there is a toughness of heart. And in many ways, the Russians, there, there are some common similarities because so much of Russia is so wild. It's kind of like our Wild West. And they, they, their frontiers is 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 the, is everywhere. the Russian covered. Far East. Well, and, their their and Russian country covers uh, seven time zones. It's the largest country in terms yeah. of time zones, and has been for thousands of years of any country on Earth. So it's yeah. not surprising that the people are tough. They go all the way from Siberia to the Ural Mountains. Okay, so they've moved. Uh, they've moved their, the most sophisticated air defense system. Uh, near the Turkish border, near Georgia. Now, these are mobile systems, and they've got a range of about 400 kilometers. The radar system on the air defense system has about a 600-kilometer range. But they have an army uh, that they have reinforced and and brought in all kind of new tanks and, and new helicopters on that Georgian border because they have another army in Armenia, in Georgia is between Russia and Armenia and Armenia uh, but Iran. So they are prepared to blast through Georgia and go in uh, into Armenia and then in Iran. However, there's a new prime minister in Georgia. They may not have to fight their way through. They may be allowed to go through. Yeah, that's up that's up in the air because they still have their 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 puppet president from from NATO. Anyway, yeah, but I, by the way, uh, Georgia Shakashvili has lost, so he's being replaced now by a billionaire that was parachuted. Well, he, he's Russia. still president, but the government, uh, his party lost. He, he, he's going. He, he's, he's yeah, oh yeah, going oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Okay, now here's the situation. Here's the timeline thing. Uh, we have just over two weeks um, uh, to the election, and um, they're probably not going to do anything for a week. But in one week, 
several things come together, and, and it's most dangerous. The United States Air Force and the Israeli Air Force and the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, will be conducting a very large air defense exercise. And we've been flying troops in now for, for several days. Uh, we have some of our top missiles, air defense missiles in there. And basically, we have reinforced their uh, air defense system rather dramatically. And we've, we're taking a lot of our top Air Force and Army experts in. And we're putting them in, and so they're going to be topped off in terms of their ability to shoot down uh, as many missiles as they can. Secondly, we now have the third supercarrier battle group, uh, the Stennis Assist Joint. Howsomever, the old, on its last cruise, the old USS Enterprise battle group has temporarily left the area, and they are now uh, in uh, Naples for R&R. That R&R will end in less than a week, and they will go back uh, to the primary area around near Iran and Syria. So okay. let me read between the lines what you're saying, Tim, is that something's going to happen, maybe not this next week, but the following week, something's going to rip. It could, because all the, the hardware uh, will be there with three supercarrier battle groups, and that's at a minimum, because there's another supercarrier in the Atlantic that could, could uh, be in the uh, med very quickly. Uh, now, when I say supercarrier, I'm not just talking about the carrier. Each supercarrier has a battle group, and there's four or five, usually four Aegis-equipped uh, destroyers and cruisers. The Aegis is an air defense system that is, that is fantastic. And um, used sometime they, they augment it with a, a fifth one or a, a frigate or two. Usually there's one or two support ships. And there's always one or two nuclear-powered hunter-killer submarines with each supercarrier. So now there's three of those giant battle groups. In addition, I think it's the Indojimo. There's another flat top that's an, what we call an assault uh, carrier that can launch uh, Harrier jets as well as lots of uh, helicopters. And it usually has a couple Aegis ships with it. So you've got four flat tops there. And there will be in one week. And at the same time, we have all these Air, air Force uh, aircraft and missile systems uh, just to the max in, in, in Israel. One week, and that will be about one and a half weeks before the election. Now, are we going to attack? No, I don't think so. But remember, Syria is the back door to a war with Iran, a general Middle East war, and all it takes are a couple mortars going across the border, fired a false flag operation, and all of a sudden, bam, everything blows yeah. up. What you're saying is it's a hair trigger. It's like a uh, it's like a minefield when somebody tries to go dancing. It's a hair trigger with a five pound pull, and somebody's pulling four and a half pounds already. Oh boy. back and uh tim this is uh, uh chris are you there today chris uh, i'm here i'm, I'm hi chris here. we're, we're, we're going to let, let, let me finish up real quick and because i know I, I chris is some I, important I, stuff yeah i want you to finish I, I, up I, I, on some of the analysis of, of some of this because i think that your analysis is really close to where i think it's going i think if obama thinks it's slipping He's going to allow or permit things to kind of get it more out of control, yeah. how, it, to whatever extent he can do that, or not well, intervene to stop it, it from it going further out, out of control. So, so two jerks with a uh, 80 or 82 millimeter mortar uh, can trigger what could become the Third World War, certainly uh, a general Middle Eastern war. And, right. and remember, this is a multi-level chess game. At the highest level, it's a spiritual battle between God and, the, and Satan, between the forces of good and the forces of evil. Coming down a bit, uh, but above this military thing in the Middle East, is the whole economic thing. It's all interrelated. And the global banking cartel families, they have 
organized everything to get to a certain point where everything has to collapse so they can have a new currency and they can control everything. But there's an awful lot of dangers with that, and they're fully cognizant of that. And nothing facilitates what they want to do in terms of changing society like war. Because when you have a, a general war, a, a world t- uh, war, then you can impose military national security uh, blanket over everything. And uh, I think that's where we're going at, and I think Obama is, is desperate, and I think uh, in a week we, we could be in a very dangerous position with all the forces in place ready for the, just a tiny spark. And remember, Americans traditionally don't want to change horses in the middle of the stream if there's a war on and I think that may be the thinking in but, the Obama camp. But, but I think what may happen, though, and this may be something where on social... I don't think Obama is going to win, by the way. No, I, I, I think, think the only area where he looks like, at least on the stage, he keeps on putting out the card that, that he's a better supporter of women's rights, which means abortion, yeah. Planned Parenthood, etc., which isn't women's rights. Firstly, the most important women's rights is jobs. Uh, secondly, the most important women's rights is the right to equal pay, which I'm sure Romney supports. Uh, I don't think Obama actually is really, he says he's for women's rights, but really his right to have an abortion, which is to kill their baby. It's, that's not the right to support a proper family or have two parents well, in well, home, that's right, or I, normal I, I marriage, do. or normal marriage where there's two, you know, two people of opposite sex in the home, home where they're married and they have enough incomes that they can have a stable family and not be destitute. Uh, what I think was going to happen, though, is this coming Monday, is that Romney is going to make mincemeat out of Obama. I think Obama is going to go ballistic, and uh, the powers to be behind him are going to do almost anything to stop it. Now, no matter what goes on, this is such a close election, we could have a split between the popular vote and the Electoral College. The Congress may well have to get involved. This is going to be disputed for months. And, well, if it uh, is, if it is how the, how the Constitution works, and remember when we had the chi- hanging chad issue uh, uh, quite a few years ago, the Supreme Court got involved. The Supreme Court has no role at all in deciding the president not under the Constitution. It's strictly up to the House of Representatives to decide who, who won the presidential race, if there's any, any question at all, and the U.S. Senate to decide the, the vice president's race. It is possible to have a Democratic president, Republican vice president, or vice versa. Now, in, in the Senate, they vote as senators, and there's 100 votes. But in the House of Representatives, they vote by states, and it will be the new Congress that's elected. So it's, it, it, it's not just who controls the House of Representatives, but it's based on the number of states. So you could have a situation where uh, you have some, uh, some states with only one congressman or two or three congressmen, and they vote one way, but a big state with lots of, like 40 or 50, like uh, California and New York, vote the other way. And you can get some strange results out of that, but that's part of the Constitution. So yeah, it, it could get uh, dicey, but the but in terms of the Middle East, the the real danger is all this firepower and everything coming in place in about one week, and which will be about a week and a half before the election. And yeah. all it takes is one tiny spark, and everything in the world changes, including in the election. Exactly. But another interesting twist is Billy Graham's website to remove Mormonism from its cult list has made public statements in support of Romney. That's a big Well, I think, I, 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 I think Mormonism is a cult. I don't, of course it is. I, yeah. I, I think they're, they're good. But, 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 a lot but, of but them are good people. people. Here, here's and, the point. Where no matter what they believe in, they're conservative. They're not terrorists. They're not going to blow up airliners. Yeah. They're more conservative than most Christians in terms and, of pro-life And, and they issues. believe in, 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 in a year's supply of food reserves. And, yeah, exactly. Uh, so if you actually just look at it, they... they one another, by the way. Exactly. So you never see them destitute. So to be honest with you, in their external behavior, although they're not, quote, Christians in the typical sense, the people, they want to call themselves Christians, their viewpoint... It doesn't matter. They're not Muslims. They're not going to talk about Sharia law. They're not going to blow up airliners. They're, they're, you know, people need to kind of grasp this. They've been, that I think if Mitt Romney gets in and we just make it clear that he's not a Christian and competing to become Mormons because we now have a Mormon president, that 
we need to understand that he's a good business manager, he's a good man that wants to do the job, and yeah, there's problems and he's got warts on him, but I think we can put a choke chain on him. The Mormon church has obviously talked to him and his colleagues and his family. You can't compromise like he did when he was governor of Massachusetts on the abortion issue. Whatever he was then, he is now pro-life, and he's made well, a public statement against the Planned Parenthood. Massachusetts is the most liberal state in the union. Yeah, right. But the point is, right now, no matter what he was before and whatever he compromised, we see this with doctors. We see it with a lot of people that are strongly pro-life now. They were pro-choice or compromised in the past. I confronted people at conferences <clears throat> that were pro-life, but what did they say? What about in the case of Down syndrome? What in the case of rape or incest? And I said, well, this was three years before I went ahead. Still human being. You're I said, still well, killing a baby. Right, but 95% of the people who call themselves pro-life would, would kill in the case of rape or incest. I said, well, my previous pastor was a product of rape and incest, and then three years later, I had my daughter has Down syndrome. So, you know, people that, that, that want to be absolutists, I said, look, 95% of the people who call themselves pro-life have all kinds of exclusions, including birth defects and Down syndrome. So, you know, let's let's get real here. A lot of the people that were pro-abortion have never done one, including doctors. They haven't been in an abortuary. They do not know what it's about. And then when people want to argue and think they have a room for an opinion, they don't have a right to an opinion. It, 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 they need to shut the damn mouth up. If they haven't been in an abortuary and put... If they haven't put the pieces of a baby back together after you do the suction curatage, if they haven't seen it physically in front of them, they don't know what the hell they're talking about, and they're full of it. And they're lying pieces of human gar garbage. So when people say it's not a baby, it's not a person, it, look, it, it's ridiculous. All Congress has to do is pass a law that says that the baby is a baby at the moment of conception. And the Supreme Court justices have already passed when they put Roe versus Wade in the early 70s that it would completely wipe out all abortion. It wouldn't happen at all under any circumstance. And when they say, well, in the house of the mother, First off, a tubal pregnancy is not an abortion. And there's no other situation, cancer or otherwise, where the health of the mother is involved. I would argue with any specialist, and I have, on radio shows, on television, and face-to-face, and -face, there is no condition, including cancer, where abortion will save the life of the mother. None. Zero. Nada. Not a damn exclusion. Okay? None. In fact, when you do abortion and a woman has cancer, they have much higher chances of their immune system collapsing and the cancer rips through them and kills them quickly. And I've seen it firsthand. So when people say, oh, that's not true, Dr. Deagle, sorry, you don't have a right for an opinion. I've been there, done life. It's like somebody has been in a battlefield and you got battle wounds. I've been there. You don't have a right to a damned opinion. You don't know what you're talking about. Important. That rant is important. People need to know that to set aside this well, thing. Well, you've seen it. Yeah, you've Mitt Romney it. belongs you've seen, to. You've seen what conservative comes out. It's not a pair of human being. Mitt, right. right. Mitt Romney is married to the same woman. He has a solid family. He has a solid business experience. He can get this country back on track. And as long as Christians realize that he's not a Christian, let's get on with it and make America stronger. Welcome back, and uh, we want to dive right into Chris Harris's uh, reports of the Los Alamos Laboratory in a muon detector way of picking up. And again, muons are a, uh, a light nuclear particle that can whip right through dirt and buildings like it's not even there. And they'll create what's called a muon shadow of exactly where the corium is underneath these reactor sites because they're actually toxic waste dump sites. They're not really a live reactor, even though they're talking about reactivating actor, reactor number five and six, by the way, at the request of Obama and his green energy czar, the czar is appointed by Obama. Tell us about this research at, National, at Los Alamos and what it means, uh, Chris. Well, well, the first thing that it means to me, if they're going to, well, first of all, let me just discuss what, what they're doing. They're, they actually put uh, Los Alamos National Lab in conjunction with uh, the Japanese government has placed at uh, units one and two Fukushima, they placed muon detectors, and they plan on using external, they're using cosmic rays basically as a light source, and the muon detectors will, will as, you, as, you, uh, as you correctly put, the, they will look for a shadow, and the shadow will be the molten fuel that's underneath, because, because uranium 
Uh, yeah, in other words, they, cosmic rays collide with the atoms in the upper atmosphere and whip through the Earth. And what you'll see with the muon detectors, you'll see a shadow where those muons are being absorbed by the radioisotopes and they're not being, uh, they're not being in the sense, deflected. So you're going to see a shadow where there's a corium underneath there, right? And what it, what it means, to, well, but if they have to go to such measures, it means that they're expecting to find this stuff very deep into the ground. Otherwise, there would be no reason to use this kind of technology unless they want to do just some kind of an experiment. Because uranium is very dense, so the muons will not penetrate that. So, And, and we're being bombarded with uh, cosmic rays at all times. So I think it's a right. very interesting experiment. It's certainly a... Uh, it's yeah, you got to go down. Uh, you got to go down a few miles to actually be uh, avoid cosmic rays. <coughs> Some of the deep mines are doing research on uh, on uh, pi mesons and neutri- neutrinos. <coughs> the neutrino telescopes underneath the South Pole. You have to go down a very deep distance to be able to put a pi meson telescope or a muon telescope, where actually you're looking for muons. Yeah, that's because that's the only thing that that will penetrate that deep is the the, the neutrinos. Yeah, exactly. So uh, please continue. Uh, This is important. They don't have any control of the situation. Uh, Even smaller earthquakes will cause a complete loss of control of the site and a massive burst of radiation. And it's only a matter of time before it happens. We've got the filling of the magma chamber at uh, Mount Fuji, the uh, OI, as well as the Chiba reactors are seeing radon fault lines that are all adjacent to these active fault lines that are 500% more active. They're scrambling. They even did a war game in the summer getting ready for mass evacuation of Greater Tokyo, which is 45 million people, the largest metropolitan area on Earth. And the U.S. government have left material and people, logistic people, in place in Tokyo, and the Tokyo people try to act like everything's fine, even though they're getting monster turnips and vegetables that are weird, and they're literally with doing hard spray downs or you know jet sprays of fruit so they can deliver fresh fruit. And they're even, by the way, still shipping meat now from Fukushima to America and fish products. So those are not not blocked in American ports. They're still shipping in material food products. From Japan, they're radioactive. Yeah, but they glow in the yeah, dark, so you you can save on an energy cost. Yeah, you don't actually need to turn on the lights to find out where you, to get to the bathroom. Just open your eyeballs, and you'll actually create a light. Like your lights, your eyes become LEDs. You know. Yeah, developing uh, developing leaves and and other vegetable matter on uh, X-ray film is showing up. In Japan, that uh, there is activity embedded either either in the in the uh, plant itself, or at least uh, it's contaminated in the surface of the plant too. So uh, that's showing up. Um, I, I did send you that article. That's also showing up as black spots on on X-ray film. Um, okay. I just want to say that. Uh, uh, so what's a, that? That's really important. So. Uh, Please continue, and I want you to tie it to the other stories so we get time to finish these. We've got another six minutes. Okay, that's fine. Um, I'll, try, I'll try to bring everything all together, but I'm saying uh, and, um, we, we discussed that. Um, oh, where, where was I right now? <laughs> Just, uh, we were talking about the, uh, the finding these radioisotopes doing x rays of leaves and so on in Japan. Yeah. We have the Shinzuko uh, Prefecture plan to dispose of 23,500 tons of combustible debris uh, generated by the March 2011 earthquake. There's four cities Shinz- Shinzuko, Hamasmatsu, Sosono, and Shimada. Shimada started accepting Awadi debris in May, but has, has, has had to suspend the operation due to technical problems. They're burning it all over Japan. Uh, I get panic emails from people. Some of them are, are, are you know, biracial families where the, the, the husband is American and the wife is Japanese and live 600 kilometers uh, west of it, which is upwind, and they're actually now moving the debris into their town or city to make their city or town radioactive. It's just nuts. It is. And I know. I, and I get panic emails all the time. I know people in the United States also taking similar x ray developing uh, basically an assay to determine what kind of uh, plants are absorbing materials that are radioactive also. And they are, they are showing up. And one of them is by uh, the owner of uh, informable.com. He purchased that at his own expense. Uh, 
photographic type equipment, x-ray equipment, and is doing that. And he's finding things on uh, fast-growing vegetables such as the dandelion leaves, and he's got that published also. So it's, it's uh, wherever that source is, you know, we, we can think where, where it comes from, but it's certainly showing up. Um, yeah, by the way, I found a source. If someone out there wants to get radiation testing, I found a broker in Austin, Texas, a broker for labs all over the world, that can broker radioactive testing not only of debris of the World Trade Center, but also of any food products, water, or anything else, either in America or Japan. So if you're out there and you want to find out, you contact Dr. Deagle. I finally tracked down a broker that can broker a lab that can do the testing for you and find out exactly what's present in your food. Radioisotopes, heavy isotopes due to neutron flux, uh, tritium, whatever you want, we can find a, we can broker it and find a lab now that, so this special broker in Austin, Texas, they can do it somewhere in the world and find out what really is going on with accurate, verifiable numbers at a certified lab. Chris, uh, there was a, a marine earthquake that triggered an unusual event at Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant. You know anything about that? Just happened, uh, today. Yeah, the other day. No damage. No damage. I look, yeah, at Seabrook, yeah, near Seabrook. Yeah. Now, you have another article here you have, uh, Chris, about the Europe's nuclear power plants are ill-equipped to cope with a nuclear disaster. Uh, they're not ready at all. There's 145 reactors assessed, 121 handy, inadequate seismic instruments to detect earthquakes, and 32 lacked venting systems to prevent pressure buildup in the reactor vessel. This is exactly what was the argument between two engineering groups in Japan where they had a faux... Uh, what's called wet uh, wet field around the main reactor and they they hadn't we couldn't they knew it couldn't handle the pressure of releasing the hydrogen so one group said no don't release the hydrogen the other group says no we can't release the hydrogen because we actually didn't engineer it to handle these pressures so they knew there was going to be a hydrogen generated explosion so before the tsunami hit reactor number 1 had already lost containment of the nuclear isotopes Right. That, that brings two, two points. Number one, we need to really study that um, the mechanism for the explosions because we still don't understand it. And that that based upon that, we don't really know what corrective measures or preventive measures to rely on to prevent that from happening. And yet we're coming out with all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, corrective measures. And we're saying that if you do this, it'll be everything will be fine. We don't know that really for a fact. I'm just calling for a really further study. And we did just discuss yeah. on another program that that study will take five years to to, uh, to determine really what the root causes are. And so That's too little, too late. Going, and the other thing, of course, is the cybersecurity that you have. We have the blog listed up here from yesterday. The NRC is joining the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, and others in support of National Cyber Awareness Month's campaign to stop, think, connect. The fact is we already know that smart meters increase uh, the danger of cyber uh, invasion and cyber attacks against our power grid, our station blackouts, and our nuclear reactors, and even things like uh, distribution networks. We know that it increases the risk, but yet the Obama administration under its green planning and Agenda 21 is pushing this, which increases the risk of a cyber attack against our reactors, our power grids, and station blackouts that will cause meltdowns and explosions at our nuclear plants. Any comments? Well, it, you know, I bring up their own words on that. It says, you know, uh, that they're, that the grid is at risk and that NERC, which is the National Electric Reliability Commission, is tasked with finding ways to protect it against cyber attacks. Right. Whether, and you got, by the way, you got another article here out that just as we're going, Japan reporter Fukushima plant reactor building steel frame is severely crushed. They're finally admitting that this is a damaged building where they can't extract the fuel rods. It's just a toxic waste dump ready to blow. And Amazing reports. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Tim. Back tomorrow with other amazing updates.